Peska's face and manner, on the evening when we confronted each other at my mother's gate, were more than sufficient to inform me that something extraordinary had happened. It was quite useless, however, to ask him for an immediate explanation. I could only conjecture, while he was dragging me in by both hands, that, knowing my habits, he had come to the cottage to make sure of meeting me that night, and that he had some news to tell of an unusually agreeable kind. We both bounced into the parlor in a highly abrupt and undignified manner. My mother sat by the open window laughing and fanning herself. Pesca was one of her especial favorites and his wildest eccentricities were always pardonable in her eyes. Poor dear soul! From the first moment when she found out that the little professor was deeply and gratefully attached to her son, she opened her heart to him unreservedly, and took all his puzzling foreign peculiarities for granted, without so much as attempting to understand any one of them. My sister Sarah, with all the advantages of youth, was, strangely enough, less pliable. She did full justice to Pesca's excellent qualities of heart, but she could not accept him implicitly, as my mother accepted him, for my sake. Her insular notions of propriety rose in perpetual revolt against Pesca's constitutional contempt for appearances, and she was always more or less undisguisedly astonished at her mother's familiarity with the eccentric little foreigner. I have observed, not only in my sister's case, but in the instances of others, that we of the young generation are nothing like so hardy and so impulsive as some of our elders. I constantly see old people flushed and excited by the prospect of some anticipated pleasure which altogether fails to ruffle the tranquility of their serene grandchildren. Are we, I wonder, quite such genuine boys and girls now as our seniors were in their time? Has the great advance in education taken rather too long a stride, and are we in these modern days, just the least trifle in the world too well brought up? Without attempting to answer those questions decisively, I may at least record that I never saw my mother and my sister together in Pesca's society, without finding my mother much the younger woman of the two. On this occasion, for example, while the old lady was laughing heartily over the boyish manner in which we tumbled into the parlor, Sarah was perturbedly picking up the broken pieces of a teacup, which the professor had knocked off the table in his precipitate advance to meet me at the door. I don't know what would have happened, Walter, said my mother, if you had delayed much longer. Pesca has been half mad with impatience, and I have been half mad with curiosity. The professor has brought some wonderful news with him, in which he says you are concerned, and he has cruelly refused to give us the smallest hint of it till his friend Walter appeared. Very provoking, it spoils the set, murmured Sarah to herself, mournfully absorbed over the ruins of the broken cup. While these words were being spoken, Pesca, happily and fussily unconscious of the irreparable wrong which the crockery had suffered at his hands, was dragging a large armchair to the opposite end of the room, so as to command us all three, in the character of a public speaker addressing an audience. Having turned the chair with its back towards us, he jumped into it on his knees, and excitedly addressed his small congregation of three from an impromptu pulpit. Now, my good dears, began Pesca, who always said good dears when he meant worthy friends, listen to me. The time has come, I recite my good news, I speak at last. Here, here, said my mother, humoring the joke. The next thing he will break, Mama, whispered Sarah, will be the back of the best armchair. I go back into my life, and I address myself to the noblest of created beings, continued Pesca, vehemently apostrophizing my unworthy self over the top rail of the chair. Who found me dead at the bottom of the sea, through cramp, and who pulled me up to the top, and what did I say when I got into my own life and my own clothes again? Much more than was at all necessary, I answered as doggedly as possible, for the least encouragement in connection with this subject invariably let loose the professor's emotions in a flood of tears. I said, persisted Pesca, that my life belonged to my dear friend, Walter, for the rest of my days, and so it does. I said that I should never be happy again till I had found the opportunity of doing a good something for Walter, and I have never been contented with myself till this most blessed day. Now, cried the enthusiastic little man at the top of his voice, 
the overflowing happiness bursts out of me at every pore of my skin, like a perspiration, for on my faith, and soul, and honor, the something is done at last, and the only word to say now is right all right. It may be necessary to explain here that Pesca prided himself on being a perfect Englishman in his language, as well as in his dress, manners, and amusements. Having picked up a few of our most familiar colloquial expressions, he scattered them about over his conversation whenever they happened to occur to him, turning them, in his high relish for their sound and his general ignorance of their sense, into compound words and repetitions of his own, and always running them into each other, as if they consisted of one long syllable. Among the fine London houses where I teach the language of my native country, said the professor, rushing into his long-deferred explanation without another word of preface, there is one, mighty fine, in the big place called Portland. You all know where that is? Yes, yes, course of course. The fine house, my good dears, has got inside it a fine family. A mama, fair and fat, three young misses, fair and fat, two young misters, fair and fat, and a papa, the fairest and the fattest of all, who was a mighty merchant, up to his eyes in gold, a fine man once, but seeing that he has got a naked head and two chins, fine no longer at the present time. Now mind. I teach the sublime Dante to the young misses, and ah, my soul bless my soul, it is not in human language to say how the sublime Dante puzzles the pretty heads of all three. No matter, all in good time, and the more lessons the better for me. Now mind. Imagine to yourselves that I am teaching the young misses today, as usual. We are all four of us down together in the hell of Dante. At the seventh circle, but no matter for that, all the circles are alike to the three young misses, fair and fat, at the seventh circle, nevertheless, my pupils are sticking fast, and I, to set them going again, recite, explain, and blow myself up red-hot with useless enthusiasm, when a creak of boots in the passage outside, and in comes the golden papa, the mighty merchant with the naked head and the two chins. Ha! My good dears, I am closer than you think for to the business, now. Have you been patient so far? Or have you said to yourselves, deuce what the deuce? Pesca is long-winded tonight? We declared that we were deeply interested. The professor went on. In his hand, the golden papa has a letter, and after he has made his excuse for disturbing us in our infernal region with the common mortal business of the house, he addresses himself to the three young misses, and begins, as you English begin everything in this blessed world that you have to say, with a great oh, oh, my dears, says the mighty merchant, I have got here a letter from my friend, mister, the name has slipped out of my mind, but no matter, we shall come back to that. Yes, yes. Right, all right. So the papa says, I have got a letter from my friend, the mister, and he wants a recommend from me, of a drawing master, to go down to his house in the country. My soul bless my soul. When I heard the golden papa say those words, if I had been big enough to reach up to him, I should have put my arms round his neck, and pressed him to my bosom in a long and grateful hug. As it was, I only bounced upon my chair. My seat was on thorns, and my soul was on fire to speak but I held my tongue, and let Papa go on. Perhaps you know, says this good man of money, twiddling his friend's letter this way and that, in his golden fingers and thumbs, perhaps you know, my dears, of a drawing master that I can recommend? The three young misses all look at each other, and then say, with the indispensable great O to begin, Oh, dear no, Papa. But here is Mr. Pesca, at the mention of myself I can hold no longer, the thought of you, my good dears, mounts like blood to my head, I start from my seat, as if a spike had grown up from the ground through the bottom of my chair, I address myself to the mighty merchant, and I say, English phrase, dear sir, I have the man, the first and foremost drawing master of the world. Recommend him by the post tonight, and send him off, bag and baggage, English phrase again, ha, send him off, bag and baggage, by the train tomorrow. Stop, stop, says Papa, is he a foreigner, or an Englishman? English to the bone of his back, I answer. Respectable, says Papa. Sir, I say, for this last question of his outrages me, and I have done being familiar with him, sir. The immortal fire of genius burns in this Englishman's bosom, and, what is more, his father had it before him. 
Never mind, says the golden barbarian of a papa, never mind about his genius, Mr. Pesca. We don't want genius in this country, unless it is accompanied by respectability, and then we are very glad to have it, very glad indeed. Can your friend produce testimonials, letters that speak to his character? I wave my hand negligently. Letters? I say. Ha! My soul bless my soul. I should think so, indeed. Volumes of letters and portfolios of testimonials, if you like. One or two will do, says this man of phlegm and money. Let him send them to me, with his name and address. And stop, stop, Mr. Pesca, before you go to your friend, you had better take a note. Bank note. I say, indignantly. No banknote, if you please, till my brave Englishman has earned it first. Banknote, says Papa, in a great surprise, who talked of banknote. I mean a note of the terms, a memorandum of what he is expected to do. Go on with your lesson, Mr. Pesca, and I will give you the necessary extract from my friend's letter. Down sits the man of merchandise and money to his pen, ink, and paper, and down I go once again into the hell of Dante, with my three young misses after me. In ten minutes' time the note is written, and the boots of Papa are creaking themselves away in the passage outside. From that moment, on my faith, and soul, and honor, I know nothing more. The glorious thought that I have caught my opportunity at last, and that my grateful service for my dearest friend in the world is as good as done already, flies up into my head and makes me drunk. How I pull my young missus and myself out of our infernal region again, how my other business is done afterwards, how my little bit of dinner slides itself down my throat, I know no more than a man in the moon. Enough for me, that here I am, with the mighty merchant's note in my hand, as large as life, as hot as fire, and as happy as a king. Ha! 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 Right, 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 all right. Here the professor waved the memorandum of terms over his head, and ended his long and voluble narrative with his shrill Italian parody on an English cheer. My mother rose the moment he had done, with flushed cheeks and brightened eyes. She caught the little man warmly by both hands. My dear, good Pesca, she said, I never doubted your true affection for Walter, but I am more than ever persuaded of it now. I am sure we are very much obliged to Professor Pesca, for Walter's sake, added Sarah. She half rose, while she spoke, as if to approach the armchair, in her turn, but, observing that Pesca was rapturously kissing my mother's hands, looked serious, and resumed her seat. If the familiar little man treats my mother in that way, how will he treat me? Faces sometimes tell truth, and that was unquestionably the thought in Sarah's mind, as she sat down again. Although I myself was gratefully sensible of the kindness of Pesca's motives, my spirits were hardly so much elevated as they ought to have been by the prospect of future employment now placed before me. When the professor had quite done with my mother's hand, and when I had warmly thanked him for his interference on my behalf, I asked to be allowed to look at the note of terms which his respectable patron had drawn up for my inspection. Pesca handed me the paper, with a triumphant flourish of the hand. Read, said the little man majestically. I promise you, my friend, the writing of the golden papa speaks with a tongue of trumpets for itself. The note of terms was plain, straightforward, and comprehensive, at any rate. It informed me. First, that Frederick Fairley, Esquire, of Limeridge House, Cumberland, wanted to engage the services of a thoroughly competent drawing master, for a period of four months certain. Secondly, that the duties which the master was expected to perform would be of a twofold kind. He was to superintend the instruction of two young ladies in the art of painting and watercolors, and he was to devote his leisure time, afterwards, to the business of repairing and mounting a valuable collection of drawings, which had been suffered to fall into a condition of total neglect. Thirdly, that the terms offered to the person who should undertake and properly perform these duties were four guineas a week, that he was to reside at Limeridge House, and that he was to be treated there on the footing of a gentleman. 
Fourthly, and lastly, that no person need think of applying for this situation unless he could furnish the most unexceptionable references to character and abilities. The references were to be sent to Mr. Fairley's friend in London, who was empowered to conclude all necessary arrangements. These instructions were followed by the name and address of Pesca's employer in Portland Place, and there the note, or memorandum, ended. The prospect which this offer of an engagement held out was certainly an attractive one. The employment was likely to be both easy and agreeable. It was proposed to me at the autumn time of the year when I was least occupied, and the terms, judging by my personal experience in my profession, were surprisingly liberal. I knew this. I knew that I ought to consider myself very fortunate if I succeeded in securing the offered employment, and yet, no sooner had I read the memorandum than I felt an inexplicable unwillingness within me to stir in the matter. I had never in the whole of my previous experience found my duty and my inclination so painfully and so unaccountably at variance as I found them now. Oh, Walter, your father never had such a chance as this, said my mother when she had read the note of terms and had handed it back to me. Such distinguished people to know, remarked Sarah, straightening herself in the chair, and on such gratifying terms of equality too. Yes, yes, the terms, in every sense, are tempting enough, I replied impatiently. But before I send in my testimonials, I should like a little time to consider. Consider, exclaimed my mother. Why, Walter, what is the matter with you? Consider, echoed my sister. What a very extraordinary thing to say, under the circumstances. Consider, chimed in the professor. What is there to consider about? Answer me this. Have you not been complaining of your health, and have you not been longing for what you call a smack of the country breeze? Well. There in your hand is the paper that offers you perpetual choking mouthfuls of country breeze for four months' time. Is it not so? Ha! Again, you want money. Well, is four golden guineas a week nothing? My soul bless my soul. Only give it to me, and my boots shall creak like the golden papas, with a sense of the overpowering richness of the man who walks in them. For guineas a week, and, more than that, the charming society of two young misses. And, more than that, your bed, your breakfast, your dinner, your gorging English teas and lunches and drinks of foaming beer, all for nothing, why, Walter, my dear good friend, do swat the deuce, for the first time in my life I have not eyes enough in my head to look, and wonder at you. Neither my mother's evident astonishment at my behavior, nor Pesca's fervid enumeration of the advantages offered to me by the new employment, had any effect in shaking my unreasonable disinclination to go to Limeridge House. After starting all the petty objections that I could think of to going to Cumberland, and after hearing them answered, one after another, to my own complete discomfiture, I tried to set up a last obstacle by asking what was to become of my pupils in London while I was teaching Mr. Fairley's young ladies to sketch from nature. The obvious answer to this was, that the greater part of them would be away on their autumn travels, and that the few who remained at home might be confided to the care of one of my brother drawing masters, whose pupils I had once taken off his hands under similar circumstances. My sister reminded me that this gentleman had expressly placed his services at my disposal, during the present season, in case I wished to leave town. My mother seriously appealed to me not to let an idle caprice stand in the way of my own interests and my own health and Pesca piteously entreated that I would not wound him to the heart by rejecting the first grateful offer of service that he had been able to make to the friend who had saved his life. The evident sincerity and affection which inspired these remonstrances would have influenced any man with an atom of good feeling in his composition. Though I could not conquer my own unaccountable perversity, I had at least virtue enough to be heartily ashamed of it, and to end the discussion pleasantly by giving way and promising to do all that was wanted of me. The rest of the evening passed merrily enough in humorous anticipations of my coming life with the two young ladies in Cumberland. Pesca, inspired by our national grog, which appeared to get into his head, in the most marvelous manner, five minutes after it had gone down his throat, 
asserted his claims to be considered a complete Englishman by making a series of speeches in rapid succession, proposing my mother's health, my sister's health, my health, and the healths, in mass, of Mr. Fairley and the two young misses, pathetically returning thanks himself, immediately afterwards, for the whole party. A secret, Walter, said my little friend confidentially, as we walked home together. I am flushed by the recollection of my own eloquence. My soul bursts itself with ambition. One of these days I go into your noble parliament. It is the dream of my whole life to be Honorable Pesca, MP. The next morning I sent my testimonials to the professor's employer in Portland Place. Three days passed, and I concluded, with secret satisfaction, that my papers had not been found sufficiently explicit. On the fourth day, however, an answer came. It announced that Mr. Fairley accepted my services and requested me to start for Cumberland immediately. All the necessary instructions for my journey were carefully and clearly added in a postscript. I made my arrangements, unwillingly enough, for leaving London early the next day. Towards evening Pesca looked in, on his way to a dinner party, to bid me goodbye. I shall dry my tears in your absence, said the professor gaily, with this glorious thought. It is my auspicious hand that has given the first push to your fortune in the world. Go, my friend. When your sun shines in Cumberland, English proverb, in the name of heaven make your hay. Marry one of the two young misses, become Honorable Hartwright, MP, and when you are on the top of the ladder remember that Pesca, at the bottom, has done it all. I tried to laugh with my little friend over his parting jest, but my spirits were not to be commanded. Something jarred in me almost painfully while he was speaking his light farewell words. When I was left alone again nothing remained to be done but to walk to the Hampstead Cottage and bid my mother and Sarah goodbye.